Esther is my favorite Bible character because she signifies strength and resilience. She was a fearless leader in her community and she went against the odds and took a stand for the Jews with her cousin Mordecai. Her courageous efforts saved her people from total extermination. Esther was the leading example for speaking up for those that didn't have much of a voice for themselves. Though faced with death, she still went to approach the king without being called by him and invited him to her banquet. Esther was aware of what was plotted against her people, and though she was anxious for the outcome, that did not stop her from fulfilling her plan. Esther's story shows God's providence. Esther was chosen to bring deliverance to the Jews. Her placement in the kingdom was crucial. Esther chapter 4 verse 14 says, For if you remain completely silent at this time, release and deliverance will arise for the Jews from another place. But you and your father's house will perish. Yet who knows whether you have come to the kingdom for such a time as this. This verse represents Esther's divine calling to save her people from genocide. God was working to ensure Esther was properly equipped to bring peace. Because Esther was placed in the palace for such a time as this, we can trust that when God places us in different situations throughout our lives, he has already ordained the course of the outcome. He has already seen it through. God does not lead us astray and we must trust him that he will bring us out of our darkest trials. Even when the odds might not be in our favor, we must fast and pray just like Esther did, and see the works that God can make in our lives. Another day's journey 
but God, God kept me here. Listen, listen, listen. It's by the grace of God that I'm still here today. He was always there, no matter what came my way. A very present help in my time of need. He was standing right there just to see all my needs. Oh, I made it through another day's journey. One more day, y'all. God kept me here. He kept his arms around me and he believes in us. I made it, I made it, I made it, I made it, made it, made it, made it, yeah. Oh, oh, oh. God kept me here. I made it, I made it, yeah. Yes, I made it. I'm still here, I'm still here. He kept his arms around me. And I made it through this week. I made it. Yeah. Yes, I made I'm it. I'm still here. Yeah. I'm still here. I made it. I made it. By the grace of God, y'all. Yes, I made I'm it. I'm still here. Yeah. I'm still here. I made it. growing up and honestly still to this day is Sailor Moon. Now you 2000 kids probably have no idea what I'm talking about unless you're into anime but still. Anyways, Sailor Moon or Serena initially believes that she is this normal girl uh, but we end up finding out that she's actually the reincarnated form of the princess of the moon kingdom. Mm -hmm. Sailor Moon. Get it? Kind of? Yeah. Well Serena is uh she's really just an underachieving, accident-prone crybaby, right? And she spends most of her battles just whining and being convinced by her magical talking cat that she's actually capable of conquering the tasks at hand um, and that, you know, her being chosen wasn't a mistake and that, you know, there's actually a rhyme and a reason to things. I mean, when I tell you I was addicted to the show, I had the bed sheets, I had the pillowcases, I had the toys, I had the dollhouse, I had the scepter, I had everything. And this is because it was unlike any show that I've ever seen before. No superhero was doing the things that Serena was doing and no superhero was ever, like no superhero would get caught saying the things that Serena said like this. But I don't want to be a warrior. <laughs> this teenage mystical princess just said, I don't want to be a warrior. <laughs> and this is the kind of protagonist that I just adored, you know, like the reluctant hero, you know, a character who could definitely find somewhere else to be and something better to do. Or the uninterested warrior, the one who is severely underwhelmed or even depressed by the grandeur that has been placed upon them. Um, and there's also, you know, the accidental champion, you know, the one whose victory comes completely by chance or coincidence. Now, this archetype is called the anti-hero. Now, the anti-hero is a protagonist who lacks some of the, or all of the conventional attributes of a traditional hero, like courage or strength or 
any kind of backbone in the case of my beloved Sailor Moon. Hey, 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 wake up, wake up, come on, I just started. Nope, come on, wake up, get in the comments right now. Let me know who is your favorite superhero. Do you have one? You know, are you into the strong and brave type like a Hercules or do you prefer the brainier and woodier type of hero like a Shuri from uh, Black Panther or Doctor Strange? Or maybe you into, you're into more of the valiant hero, you know, one that's guided by a strong moral compass like Batman or Captain America. And while we're on this topic, why do you like that particular hero? You see, I think we're drawn to these characters by one of two things. Either you see something in them that you don't see in yourself, or as in the case of the disinclined Sailor Moon and myself, you see something about yourself in them. Today, I wanna to talk about the Bible's most anti-heroic character. Oh. I'm sure most of you have heard the story a thousand times, but if you've never read it, I recommend you read it in its entirety. It is wild, okay? But for the sake of time, here is my friend OJ the DJ with the summary. Thanks, Tay Tay. Now let me tell you a story. There's this king who's having a party. He's a little bit tipsy at like 120 fermented grapes. And he called his wife. He's like, yo, we outside. Yo, my girl, come here. And his wife was like, I can have another you in a minute. Are you good? Yo, nice that. So the drunk king banishes the queen to the shadow realm. So he drops off his wife, who's like Iowa's version one, and he creates the next top model. While Esther's living with her relatives, Uncle Reese, AKA Mordecai, whatever you want to call him. But she hears about, you know, Jeff Bezos and Bill Gates breaking up. And she's like, hey, I'm gonna go to the Miss America pageant. Now this next one gets all done up because it's hot girl summer. King Caesar like, what? Not like dating with a seal, but you know what I'm talking about. So he marries her. The king has this advisor named Haman. He's like a level six hater, evil energy, the type of dude to put milk in before his cereal. He hates Mordecai, wants to kill him until he passes out. So he makes his law that he kills all Jews. Him and Judas, they gotta have the same last name, same type of energy. They, their names rhyme, I'm sure. I hate you. But then her uncle comes around and he's like, yeah, hey, you moving kind of mucky still, man. Sorry, you're getting murked and you're out there hugging the king like you're Logan Paul or something. So you don't help with the fam? It's all good because God's gonna send another Jedi Knight, but you're probably gonna get Gurks next. So you better get your Disney Brave outfit on, start a Mandarin, and talk to your little hubby before you get. Six and a half hours later. Moving along, I'm all out of time cards. So Esther grabs her makeup from Sephora, Delilah. I can't remember. She goes to the king. She's like, hey, want to know what makes Drake and I similar? Other than the fact that we both have Jewish backgrounds, we both make hits. And we both make a hit on Haman right now. I told you. <laughs> you die for that. And Haman gets Thanos. Yep. Yes, I understand. That was not theologically correct. Esther's the kind of character whose story really happens without her. You know, there the story is dramatic, but as the plot twists and turns, Esther is just safely carried along like a log floating down a stream. Unlike some of our other, you know, well-known Bible heroes, Esther comes to victory through some very anti-heroic means. The first is what happens to be happenstance, right? Look at it. I mean, she ends up in the kingdom of no choice of her own. The king wants his pick of the young maidens in the country. She fits the bill, so the pageant she goes, right? The other huge anti-heroic trait that Esther displays through the entire book is obedience. Now, I know what you're thinking. How could obedience be a bad thing? But think about it. It's the last two minutes of the movie, and the hero sees that dog in the window of the burning building. Everyone around him says, don't, no, wait, please. Does he obey? And then, okay, what about when there's a young girl waiting on a heart transplant, and the hero is flying the helicopter with the organ cooler, and then a storm blows in. Air traffic control says, hey, hang back. Does the hero ever? No, they fly straight into the storm and defiantly save the day. I mean, look, if Iron Man had just listened to Pepper, he'd still be alive today. But so would Thanos. And, well, not Spider-Man, though. The metaphor is rough. And I say all this to say that disobeying instructions is key to the hero's ammo. Okay, but Esther seems so timid, like page after page, chapter after chapter, she's just doing what she's told. I mean, let's look at the interview section of the pageant, okay? If you uh, have your Bibles, which you should, shame. Esther 2 verse 2, okay? Now, when the 
the turn came for each young woman to go into the king after the end of her 12 months under the regulations for women for the days of their beauty treatment were completed as follows. My God, this is the longest pageant ever. Six months with oil of myrrh and six months with balsam oils and the cosmetics for women. 13, the young woman would go into the king in this way. Anything that she desired was given to her. Uh, verse 15 now. Now, when Esther came into the king, she did not request anything except what Haggai, the king's eunuch, who was in charge of the woman, advised. So she could ask for anything, but she just says what she's told to say, right? Just And a, another big instance of this is when Esther just withholds her heritage from the king, right? If we look at uh, Esther 2 verse 10, it says, Esther did not make known her people or her kindred for Mordecai had instructed her that she should not make them known. Good old Esther. Now, I just want to say that we're halfway through the second chapter and the child has yet to do anything spectacular, okay? The next section of the text says that Esther informed the king that two men were planning to kill him. Wow, Essie, way to sell you the day, except no, because verse 22 says that she informed the king on Mordecai's behalf because he was the one who overheard the criminals plotting. So at this point, I'm getting ready to call this the book of Mordecai and dub Esther just the Robin to his Batman because... Come on. You guys know in chapter four, the section where we get the hallmark line, if I perish, I perish, which is really just the most King James Version way of saying YOLO. Do, do you want to know the heading for that section? Like the, the subtitle? <clears throat> it's called Mordecai Persuades Esther. Yes, that familiar heroic moment when the hero has to be persuaded to save the day? Come on, man! Chapter 4, verse 6. So Hatak went to out to Mordecai in the open square of the city uh, in the front of the king's gate. Mordecai told him everything that had happened to him, including the exact amount of money Haman had promised to pay into the royal treasury for the destruction of the Jews. He also gave him a copy of the text of the edict for their annihilation to show Esther and explain it to her. And he told him to instruct her to go into the king's presence and beg for mercy and plead with him for her people. So what you're telling me is the story altering plan wasn't even her idea. Like, are you guys following? Uh, verse nine, Hatak went back and reported to Esther what Mordecai had said. Then she instructed him to say to Mordecai, all the king's official and the people of the royal provinces know that for any man or woman who approaches the king in the inner court without being summoned by the king has but one law, that they be put to death unless the king extends the gold scepter to them and spares their lives. But 30 days have passed since I was called to go to the king. And this is just the most anti-heroic trait right here. Fear. I mean... Okay, I mean, it, it's justified, right? I mean, it's your life on the line, but come on, hero queen. Verse 12, when Esther's words were reported to Mordecai, he sent back this answer. Do not think that because you are in the king's house, you alone of all the Jews will escape. So Uncle Mordecai said, a no ma'am. And verse 14, my favorite, for if you remain silent at this time, re relief and deliverance will arise for the Jews from another place. Like y'all thought I was being hard on Esther? Here is Uncle Mordecai with the God's gonna save us with or without you. He goes on, and you and your father's house will perish. It sure will. And who knows whether you've not attained royalty for such a time as this. I, I realize that I'm being really hard on our beloved Shiro. Like I didn't come here to slander the girl, but I, I just want to drive home for, I mean, comedic and spiritual reasons that she did not fit the image of the typical hero. Y'all still don't believe me? Okay. After this cussing from uncle and the days of fasting and praying, Esther finally does something, okay? Now, picture this with me. It is the climax of the film, okay? She bursts through the door of the throne room. Everyone gasps. They look at Esther in shock, and then they look back at the king like, ooh, snap. Will he extend the scepter? Will he not? Is he gonna kill the queen? Ah! And then scepter, okay? 
At this point, I imagine the room is still silent as everybody's probably wondering what in the world Esther can be to tell the king that she was worth risking her life for. And I'm, I'm certain they were awestruck when all she did was ask the man to come to dinner. Like, are, are you hearing me, saints? Are you with me? Hello? Come on. The child faith face death itself, right? And rather than say, right then and there, hey, save my people, she's like, mm, kind of hungry, I'll tell you later. And, and then if you know the story, it takes two separate dinners before she says what she needs to save the day. It's heroic procrastination. Oh God, that take was just so good. I can't even, I'm not going back. But what I wanted to say was, it's the heroic procrastination for me. You know what this reminds me of? Um, if you guys ever wanted to like break up with someone, but you, but you just like couldn't do it, like you call them and then you panic and you decide you're like, oh, like, like, let's set a date and just see them. And they're like, oh, I'll do it when I see them. And then you see them and you panic again. And again and again until one day you finally just do it or you end up marrying them. Esther's me, man. Like, afraid, uncertain, law-abiding, like, not willing to ruffle any feathers, really uh, docile, hella beautiful. Like, she's me. <laughs> I mean, but, like, she's, she's, she's us, right? Like, waking up every day to just get the task done, get the grade, do the job, get back home, have a nap. You know, sometimes noticing God's grace and favor working, moving and shifting around, but most days just missing all of those intricacies, right? Missing his providence. Like God isn't mentioned once in this entire book, but when you finish watching the stream, take a look and you'll see that he's really the main character in this story. Because every moment of delay, every moment of silence, and every moment that she chose to speak up was so carefully orchestrated. Like, it, God conquered enemies that Israel had had from ages through this one story, through the timing of these two dinners, through through Mordecai seeing what he saw and, and literally cussing Esther into making a move and risking it all. Listen. What I really want to tell you guys, I think all I really want to tell you guys is that God doesn't need you. <laughs> Sorry, there was literally no better way to say this. Like, he really doesn't, though. You know what I mean? You're not strong enough or intelligent enough to do anything for him. He doesn't need you. And I mean, like that scripture says, it says relief and deliverance will come. The healing is going to come. The blessing is going to come. Revival is going to come. And I mean, because God's word is not going to return unto him void. He, so what he spoke is going to happen. But the question is, will it happen with you or without you? Right? Will he be working in spite of you or will he be working through you? And the gag is... The choice is yours. Just like Esther, he's carved out this path for us to walk, right? And he's orchestrated your circumstances to the T. In each moment, he sets up the perfect shot and we just have to take it. I mean, insert basketball analogy here. But the thing about this shot and about the setup is that we don't have to take the shot. Like, <laughs> this is about to be the worst appeal ever. You do not have to take this step, regardless of what you've been told, regardless of who is forcing you to be, wherever they're forcing you to be, you do not have to make this choice, right? Like, uh, granted, the rewards are great, you know, the promise of salvation, heaven, blah, 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 but it's not an easy life after that choice, right? It gets harder. You'll have to deny yourself the things you want or the things that you're used to doing, the things you think you'll, you need. You're going to end up facing demons in your own mind. Like, I just want to be honest with you. It's a fight. The only difference is that you won't be fighting alone. 
Now, if you can't tell from this sermon or sharing or whatever you want to name this, <laughs> I am not a pastor or anything close to it. But if you want God to start working through you rather than in spite of you, you can pray this with me or something like this, whatever words you have. Um, you can say, God, I am nowhere near perfect. And I'm, and I'm not at all qualified to serve you. I've made mistakes before, but I am willing to change my mind. Thank you for meeting me here. And I'd, I'd love it if you stay. It can be a beautiful story, you know, yours. And I mean, and Esther's, you know. <laughs> I mean, she didn't do anything too flashy. You know, she wasn't tearing down walls or slaying giants or anything. You know, God was the one doing all of that. And yet, he put her name on the book. Taylor, Taylor, you sing so good, but you also can deliver a word. And we thank you for that. Happy Sabbath, everyone. I hope you have a great week. But don't forget, Sabbath School is right after this. And you also have the Revelation series this evening. Bye.